In 2008, in a shipyard in China, a single machine did the impossible. It lifted an object weighing 20,133 metric tons. That's the equivalent of two Eiffel Towers, lifted clean into the air in one go. This was the heaviest lift in history, performed by a gantry crane named Tysoon. We see cranes on city skylines and think we understand their scale, but a lift like this exists in a different reality. This was a war against physics itself. But that record is just the beginning. It begs the question, what is the actual limit? To find out, we'll explore the incredible strength of the steel and wire rope that make these lifts possible. We'll uncover the titans of the land, built to challenge solid ground, and then go offshore to see how that same limit is conquered by floating giants in the open ocean. The secret to lifting heavier isn't up in the sky. It starts right under our feet. Before a crane can lift anything, it must first conquer its oldest and most unpredictable enemy, the ground. The most powerful engine and the strongest steel are useless if the earth beneath the machine gives way. This is the world of ground-bearing pressure, an invisible force that dictates the absolute limits of construction. Every square foot of ground has a breaking point, a maximum load it can endure before it shears and collapses. For engineers, this isn't just a challenge, it's the first law of heavy lifting. Think of it like this. A 180-pound person wearing a stiletto heel exerts an immense pressure of over 2,000 pounds per square inch on a tiny point, easily sinking into soft ground or damaging a floor. The same person wearing a snowshoe distributes their weight, staying afloat on snow. Cranes are no different, but the scale is monumental. A massive crawler crane, like a Manitowoc 31,000, can weigh over 2,500 tons before it even picks up a load. All that force is directed downwards through its tracks. On unprepared soil, which might only handle 500 pounds per square foot, it would sink like a stone. To counteract this, engineers rely on enormous steel tracks and, for mobile cranes, massive outriggers that extend from the chassis. These act like snowshoes, spreading the machine's immense weight over the largest possible area. The numbers are staggering. A standard concrete slab can withstand around 3,000 pounds per square inch. Heavily compacted engineered soil might handle 10,000 pounds per square foot. A miscalculation here is catastrophic. A $100 million machine, carefully balanced for a critical lift, can suddenly tilt, buckle, and collapse, all because the ground couldn't take the strain. Every major lift is therefore preceded by exhaustive geotechnical surveys and soil analysis. Often, the lift site itself must be constructed, involving the excavation of tons of soil and the creation of deep foundations made of compacted gravel or massive steel mass, sometimes several feet thick. The machine's raw power is secondary. Its stability is everything. The ground is the ultimate arbiter of what's possible. It doesn't care about the value of the load or the deadline for the project. It only cares about pressure. So once the ground is mastered, how does the machine itself withstand these colossal forces? Solving the ground problem is only the first half of the battle. Now, the forces must be channeled through the machine itself. A crane is not just a brute, it's a carefully engineered system where every component, from the steel in its bones to the cables that act as its muscles, is pushed to the absolute edge of its material limits. It starts with the steel. The iconic lattice booms of large cranes aren't made from ordinary structural steel. They are fabricated from ultra-high tensile alloys metals engineered at a molecular level to provide the highest possible strength to weight ratio. This steel can have a tensile strength of up to 130,000 pounds per square inch, meaning a one inch bar could theoretically support a dozen cars. This strength 
allows the boom to be incredibly long and strong, yet light enough not to collapse under its own weight. It's a delicate balance, an industrial skeleton designed for maximum reach and power. Then come the muscles, the wire rope. What looks like a simple steel cable is in fact a complex machine. A single heavy lift rope is composed of hundreds of individual high strength steel wires, twisted into strands. Those strands are then twisted around a central core. This intricate design provides both immense strength and crucial flexibility, allowing the rope to bend around pulleys and spool onto a winch drum without fracturing. On a crane like the Tysoon, there are over 16 miles of this specialized cable, each inch of it a critical link in the chain of power. But the real secret to multiplying force lies in a principle that's thousands of years old – mechanical advantage. The hook of a heavy lift crane is not hanging from a single rope. It is attached to a massive block containing a series of pulleys or sheaves. The wire rope is threaded back and forth between this hook block and another set of pulleys at the tip of the boom. This is known as reeving. For every loop of rope that supports the load, the force required by the winch is divided. A system reeved with 10 parts of line can lift a 100 ton load with only 10 tons of pulling force on the winch drum, minus friction. The Tysoon uses this principle on a staggering scale, turning the raw power of its winches into an unstoppable lifting force. With the physics of steel and leverage in place, engineers began to build machines that could dominate the land. The journey to lifting 20,000 metric tons wasn't a single leap, it was a relentless evolution. The workhorses are the crawler cranes. A machine like the Liebherr LR13000 with its 3,000 ton capacity is a marvel. Its key innovation is the superlift system. This is a secondary towering derrick mast attached to the back of the crane, which connects to a massive, suspended tray of counterweights. This tray can be loaded with hundreds of tons and positioned at a huge radius. It acts as a powerful anchor, dramatically increasing the crane's leverage and its load moment capacity, preventing it from tipping forward with a heavy load far from its center. But to go even heavier, engineers had to almost abandon mobility. The solution was the ring crane. These behemoths, like the Mamut SK6000, are built on site upon a massive steel ring. As the largest land-based crane in the world, the SK6000 is in a league of its own, capable of lifting an astonishing 6,000 metric tons. As strategic assets that can cost hundreds of millions of dollars and take weeks to assemble, they are brought in for the most demanding projects in the energy sector, like lifting entire modules for liquefied natural gas plants in a single piece. To achieve the ultimate lift, however, the crane had to stop being a machine brought to a site and become part of the landscape itself. This brings us back to the Tysoon Gantry Crane. Standing at 433 feet tall, the Tysoon is the facility. Because its foundation is permanent, ground pressure is no longer the primary constraint. This allowed it to perform its world record lift. The load was a massive, fully integrated deck box for a semi-submersible drilling rig. As the Tysoon's 20 individual heavy lift winches, each with a capacity of over 1,000 tons, and synchronized by a central computer to ensure a perfectly balanced lift, took the strain, the 20,133 metric ton module was lifted and lowered into place. It was a moment of supreme industrial achievement. But as you're about to see, the challenge of lifting 20,000 tons on solid land is nothing compared to doing it in the open ocean, where the enemy isn't the ground below, but the unpredictable chaos all around. When you move a lift offshore, the rules of the game change completely. The ground is no longer the problem. Now, the challenge is the unstable, ever-moving surface of the ocean. This is the domain of heavy lift crane vessels, some of the most complex and expensive machines ever built. 
The undisputed king of this realm is the SSCV Sleipnir. Costing over $1.5 billion to build, it is a statement of engineering dominance. It's a semi-submersible vessel. Its twin hulls can be flooded with tens of thousands of tons of seawater, allowing it to sink lower in the water. This creates a remarkably steady platform, minimizing the effect of waves, which is critical when operating in harsh environments like the North Sea. This stability is essential because the Sleipnir holds two enormous 10,000-ton capacity cranes. Working in tandem, they can lift a combined 20,000 metric tons, nearly matching the Tysoon's record, but in the hostile ocean. To hold its position, the vessel uses a DP-3 dynamic positioning system. This means it has triple redundancy in its computers, sensors, and power systems. A network of powerful thrusters, linked to GPS, makes numerous micro-adjustments every second to fight against wind and waves. A failure is not an option when you have a 10,000-ton module hanging over a billion-dollar platform. These floating giants enable the construction of our global energy infrastructure. While on land, the limit is often the ground. On the sea, the limit is the breathtakingly complex interplay of the vessel's structure, its ballast systems, and the raw power of the ocean. It's a constant, high-stakes dance with the elements, operating within tight, weather windows where a single software glitch or a sudden rogue wave could lead to disaster. It is the absolute frontier of heavy lifting. From the solid ground that threatens to give way, to the steel cables strained to their breaking point, the question of how heavy can we lift isn't about one number. It's a constant battle against gravity, physics, and the Earth itself. The Tysoon's record still stands on land, but with vessels like the Sleipnir ruling the seas, the real limit is only human ingenuity. Thanks for watching Hard Hat Industries your source for serious machines doing real work. If you like this, hit like, subscribe, and turn on notifications so you don't miss what's next. Until then, keep your head down and your gear running.